My name is Dr. Ava Roth and I work for VRAD. I am specialized in musculoskeletal radiology. This lecture focuses on the musculoskeletal ramifications of chronic renal failure that are often covered under the umbrella term of renal osteodystrophy. This lecture has been approved for continuing medical education. The learning objectives for this lecture are to understand the pathophysiology of renal osteodystrophy so that we can then appreciate how this metabolic derangement translates into common imaging findings in the context of several example cases that will also help us subsequently recognize potential differential pitfalls. To better understand the ramifications of chronic renal failure, we need to reacquaint ourselves with normal bone metabolism as being a balance between old bone resorption and new bone formation. Chronic renal failure upsets this balance as a consequence of failed phosphate clearance. This leads to hyperphosphatemia that then triggers an increase in parathyroid hormone production. The levels of parathyroid hormone are further elevated by diminished renal clearance, and this contributes to the development of secondary hyperparathyroidism that is seen in people with declining renal function. There are many consequences of this derangement as summarized here. Most notably is abnormal bone that can either appear demineralized, as with osteomalacia, or sclerotic with periostitis but it's important to remember that in either case, this bone lacks the architectural strength of normal bone. Commonly, we see consequences of elevated parathyroid hormone as excess osteoclast activity resulting in bone resorption, areas of erosion, brown tumor formation, and periostitis, as illustrated in this initial case. Here is a 30-year-old male on dialysis with a previous history of nephrectomy and parathyroidectomy. We see band-like end plate sclerosis, making the central medullary bone comparatively lucent. Upon this background, you can also appreciate a bubbly expansile lucent lesion within a thoracic vertebral body. Here on cine imaging, it is easier to appreciate the band-like areas of end plate sclerosis throughout the spine. You will also appreciate that there are more lucent lesions within the pelvis in addition to the previously observed thoracic vertebral body lesion. This first case is a combination of rugger jersey spine with osteoclastoma formation, also referred to as a brown tumor. Both rugger jersey spine and osteoclastoma development are consequences of chronically elevated parathyroid hormone with abnormal osteoid deposition at end plates causing the alternating bands of sclerosis and lucency. A differential consideration is called the sandwich vertebra that we see with osteopetrosis and which is typically less smudgy in appearance with more defined transition between the bands of sclerosis and lucency. The osteoclastoma is actually local replacement of bone with abnormal fibrous tissue causing the lucent appearance. The following cluster of cases add findings of elevated parathyroid hormone along with extra osseous deposition of excess phosphate and calcium and introduces us to consequences of chronic hemodialysis. In this patient, we see bilateral sacroiliac joint erosions with areas of sclerosis superimposed upon a background of diffusely abnormal mineralization. Cine imaging through the same patient demonstrates atrophic kidneys along with vascular and soft tissue calcifications in addition to the bilateral sacroiliac joint sclerosis and erosions.
Although we see background patchy osteosclerosis as well as scattered vascular and soft tissue calcifications in this case, the emphasis is really on the findings of bilateral sacroiliitis with alternating regions of sclerosis and erosions of both sacroiliac joints. Sacroiliitis secondary to chronic hyperparathyroidism is typically bilateral and may often involve the iliac aspect more than the sacral. But unfortunately, even with these features, it can be very difficult to distinguish from other causes of chronic sacroiliitis, particularly if you lack sufficient patient history. One thing that can really help in such instances is if there are additional areas of resorption often coexisting in patients with chronically elevated hyperparathyroidism. As in this case, where we see in this 54-year-old female, rather pronounced but fairly symmetric and bilateral, ischial tuberosity erosions. As a companion case, this patient with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease also demonstrated pronounced symmetric and bilateral greater trochanteric erosions superimposed upon a background of fairly sclerotic appearing bone, as well as diffuse vascular and soft tissue calcifications, which we will better appreciate when we get to the CINE imaging. CINE imaging through this initial patient demonstrates that they also have sacroiliitis with erosions and sclerosis spanning both joints in addition to the rather prominent bilateral ischial tuberosity erosions seen here. In this patient, we see that in addition to the greater trochanteric erosions, they have ischial tuberosity erosions and evidence of bilateral sacroiliitis as well as a rugger jersey spine. Going through the soft tissues one more time, you can appreciate the enlarged multicystic kidneys and the severity of vascular calcifications. The point with these cases is that Multifocal erosions are fairly common in individuals with chronic hyperparathyroidism, and although nonspecific, bilateral and multifocality of these findings is helpful, as well as secondary findings within the soft tissues. Hyperparathyroidism related bone resorption can actually occur practically anywhere in bones including trabecular, endosteal, subchondral, even subligamentous and subtendinous areas, it is usually bilateral and in many cases fairly symmetric. Some example locations such as subtendinous resorption is often seen at the calcaneus, the ischial tuberosities as in our example cases and the femoral trochanters, and subchondral resorption can occur at the acromacavicular joint involving the clavicular side, the sacroiliac joints, as in the recent examples, where there's more involvement of the iliac aspect, and the sternoclavicular joints, in which case both the articular surfaces are typically involved to a fairly equal severity. In the next case, let's focus more on the consequences within the soft tissues of chronically elevated byproducts such as phosphorus and calcium salts. Here we see a 45 year old female on chronic dialysis and she was presenting with abnormal blood pressure but I submit that there are additional abnormal findings here and predominantly they are pronounced bilateral periarticular masses that are cloud-like. You can appreciate internal fluid fluid levels with sedimentation and there is also osseous remodeling and destruction of the bony pelvis, as well as severe vascular calcifications. On the CINE imaging, you can better appreciate the internal fluid-fluid levels throughout these pronounced 
juxtarticular masses. Scrolling back up, we can see the degree of osseous remodeling and destruction associated with these masses, as well as the background of pronounced vascular disease. The diagnosis here is secondary tumoral calcinosis, which presents with periarticular cloud-like masses containing fluid fluid levels that can be associated with rather striking osseous remodeling. I want to emphasize that this is secondary tumoral calcinosis due to chronic renal failure. There is actually a primary tumoral calcinosis that is a rare genetic disorder, but in both cases, although the underlying initial cause may be different, what perpetuates the problem is failed excretion of phosphorus. So you get elevated calcium and phosphorus levels and subsequent precipitation of hydroxyapatite crystals in joint fluid. And you can see the chemical composition of those crystals here, and it makes it a little bit more evident why that would be the case. But because of the composition, that's what causes the fluid fluid levels and the sort of cloud-like appearance. And it's also why you find these masses in a periarticular distribution. Now, due to their size, they can cause osseous erosions and remodeling. But typically, patients will present with mechanical issues rather than pain. There are some cases of pain where the current thought is that in those individuals, maybe there was an aseptic inflammatory response present, but the etiology for this is still up for debate. The main take home point is that if you can't excrete something and you can't metabolize it, you're going to build up unfortunate levels of byproducts and those byproducts have to go somewhere. And for our final case, we will direct our attention to differential considerations that can occur as a consequence of long-term treatment for patients with chronic renal insufficiency. Here we have a 57-year-old female presenting with chest pain. She's had a distal clavicular resection, but there is also subtle clavicular subligamentous resorption deep to where the corcoclavicular ligament should attach. There is avascular necrosis of the humeral head and pronounced acetabular remodeling. There also appears to be a large joint effusion, and all of this is on a background of general osteopenia. As you can see here, it is a bilateral and fairly symmetric process. Since this is a bilateral process, we need to consider systemic and metabolic etiologies. I bring this case up as a discussion of differentials because when you see findings like this, including osteopenia and osseous destruction, our inclination is to label it an inflammatory arthritic process like rheumatoid or infection, which is less likely if it's symmetric. But we need to also consider the history of the patient because chronic renal insufficiency can result in rather destructive arthrosis. The reason for this is in part due to the underlying chronic hyperparathyroidism that leads to areas of osseous resorption and background osteopenia, but also the process can be compounded as a consequence of the patient's treatment. So for instance, you can get avascular necrosis from chronic steroid therapy if the patient has had a renal transplant, or if the patient is on chronic dialysis, they can have elevated aluminum. And aluminum toxicity used to be secondary to the actual process of dialysis, but now it's more commonly secondary to the actual agents that are used for the treatment of hyperphosphatemia. And inadequate subsequent excretion and clearance of the aluminum compounds in those agents. 
and this leads to osteopenia, spontaneous fractures, and avascular necrosis. Amyloidosis is another consideration with osteopenia, destructive soft tissue or synovial masses, and those can cause secondary osseous erosions. The following are three sources that I found useful. The take home point I hope everyone has from this lecture is that chronic renal failure is a complex process that disrupts multiple points in bone metabolism and therefore can have many imaging manifestations. Thank you so much.